So again, welcome uh, to our webinar. And uh, let's go ahead and take a quick gander at the agenda. So we're going to quickly review uh, some of the work we've done with TechBot 360 EX, uh, the design goals, and uh, we'll talk about the beta program. And certainly we have a very active beta program with over 220 or so users now. Uh, so after this presentation, if you're interested in taking this technology for a test drive, love to have you online. So, well then, uh, Dave Taftelin will be uh, spending some time talking about our new subzone load on demand technology. And so I'll be turning it over to him for that. And we'll talk about what the uh, subzone technology entails, uh, some performance results. And we're actually going to spend time showing you how you can create subzone files. And uh, finally, we will have time for Q&A. If you haven't been to one of these GoToWebinars in the past, uh, just a quick note. You'll see on your little sidebar, there's an area where it says questions. If you have a question as we're going through, uh, please go ahead and just type it into that box. Those questions will actually come across. We can see them, and uh, we'll try to address them as it makes sense within the presentation. Okay. So very quickly, uh, some of you, I think, have sat in on some previous presentations around TechBot 360EX. Uh, but TechBot 360EX is really the most significant upgrade to our technology uh, in the last 10 years. Um, this involves uh, taking TechBot 360 and more or less rebuilding it. I, I think we calculated it's about 40% of the main code had to be uh, redone. And so this is quite a rebuild for us. Uh, it uses QT technology and also a little more modular using our internal SDK. As we'll talk about, it improves performance significantly, but the primary focus was uh, performance and ease of use. And ease of use is part of performance in a way. If it's hard to use, uh, the fact that you can load results in quickly is only half the story. You do need to be able to get to the answer as quickly as possible. And there was also uh, a net benefit for people who are using Mac or Linux in that uh, the new QT technology gives a much, much more modern interface. So, so the, the key things that we've focused on thus far have been around things like uh, plot style improvements. So uh, we're not going to go through this in great detail, and we've had a couple of webinars about this, and we'll likely have another. Uh, but we've uh, implemented context menus for very quick changes of style. Uh, we've change the way uh, you do curb fitting, extracting data, changing style, this all can be done from a context menu, as well as changing how the zone styles dialog works, modernizing it using uh, ability to select zones using text and zone groups. And so uh, we won't talk about that in detail, but uh, we do have some webinars where that's been discussed. We also implemented uh, some changes to slicing, including arbitrary slicing, as well as the ability to extract slices on screen. This is very helpful as we've implemented surface slices. So in, in a way, you can slice along a wing or a body and with one click extract those uh, slices uh, to use them for further analysis and plotting. And lastly, we implemented something called Pages, which effectively is uh, much like TechBlot, or uh, pardon me, like PowerPoint, in that it allows a user to create multiple views of one or many data sets in a single layout and therefore, you can actually have a layout which contains line maps, uh, integrated plots that have both line maps and 3D or 3D separately. Uh, and this all can be saved in one simple layout. And therefore, you can also do data append or data override and have the ability to actually have like almost an entire report automated uh, in a single layout. So we're, we're very pleased with the progress we've made on that. And with that, I'm going to uh, go ahead and scoot out of the way, and we're going to send this over to Dave and Scott, and we're going to talk about some of the subzone loan on-demand technology. Okay, uh, first a little bit on what motivated this. Um, I'm uh, Dave Taplin, by the way. Uh, disks uh, are slow, and they're not speeding up as quickly as uh, processors and networks are. Uh, so over time, um, reading file off the disk has become relatively a, a slower and slower operation. So that, that points us toward uh, a way of improving performance by allowing you to read only the data that you need for the plot that you're doing right now. So we've uh, implemented um, a, a query-driven uh, set of APIs that we use internally to access our new file format 
um, which allows us to load just the bits of data that we need uh, for the plot at hand. And um, this uh, this reference is an isosurface example. I don't I don't have that one queued up. Do we have that one? We do. If we need it. We, yeah, it's okay. Okay. Maybe we'll get back to that. Um, uh, so th this uh, this changes how uh, the required time to the image you want uh, scales as your problem size increases and reduces the time to first image or your image if you're loading a layout uh, by a factor of uh, up to end of the two-thirds wherein is uh, typically the number of cells in your uh, in your solution and also reduces uh, there's a corresponding reduction in the amount of memory that you need to load that layout. Uh, another term for this technology is lazy loading. So here's a, a picture of how this works. <clears throat> now these are 2D images. In, in fact we only do this in 3D but uh, 2D is a little easier to uh, these 2D um, images make it a little easier to describe what's going on. Um, actually, uh, Scott, you want to walk us through this one? Oh, sure. This is, a, you can see, just a simple 2D grid. And the idea is, in previous versions of TechPlot, we would load an entire zone uh, as needed. So a zone is, is just a chunk of data that has been decided by the user or is in the file. And, and what we do now is we actually break it up into smaller pieces or subzones. And the subzones... Um, are loaded as needed. So, for instance, on the left, you can see we've we've taken this 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 block. Yeah, maybe we'll, let's yeah. Let's look at right this here. one. So, on the left, you can see the block um, of uh, of a two D grid. We divided it into, in this case, sixteen uh, subzones, and then uh, we can say that for that contour line, that blue line you see, um, it really only needs to load the the uh, light-colored subzones. The dark ones you don't have to load at all, and so only five sixteenths of the data needs to be loaded. Now, as you mentioned, this is an end of the two-third thing, so this is a very coarse grid, and it still has reduced it by a factor of two. Um, we've seen um, reductions of, you know, easily uh, an order of magnitude or two orders of magnitude in the amount of data that you need to load, so it's a really substantial reduction. And with disks being so slow, that makes a, a tremendous improvement in both the, the loading time and the, uh, and the memory requirements. Okay, thanks, Scott. Mm -hmm. um, here's a particular sample uh, that we've run recently. Um, we have what we call a half trap wing. You can see the, the picture of the geometry with a slice uh, that we've generated uh, through the data. Um, and then in the table uh, on the lower left side, uh, we have some timings. Uh, with our most recent released version of TechPlot 360, um, this layout took 222 seconds to load uh, with a peak memory usage of just over 20 gigabytes. Um, for comparison, uh, we ran this single threaded just to show you that indeed um, uh, 360 as it's currently released is using multiple threads. Um, so we're already achieving a, a pretty good speed up over running it single threaded. However, the bottom line shows you the effect of going to the subzone load on demand where the time to first image is reduced by uh, almost two orders of magnitude um, and the memory usage uh, is almost as advantageous. Dave, we have a couple of quick questions. Um... Richard Cook asked quickly, uh, are all the subzones the same size? I think that's what this says. It's pretty hard to read from, from my vantage point, but... Uh, yes. yes, the subzones are always the same size uh, for every data set. Yeah, we use uh, the size of the subzones is, is 256 cells and 256 nodes. We actually have separate subzones for the cells and nodes, except, you know, there will be a f um, one subzone left over. That might be smaller, you know, if you don't if you don't have this number of cells that's evenly divisible by two. Pieces. Yeah, that's for an unstructured um, subzone file. If, if we go to structured, you know, we we grab 
um, six by six by six uh, cells or nodes, and then uh, whatever you have left left over at uh, the extrema of I, J, and K uh, are smaller subzones. And Richard then uh, followed up with, "Do you save store min max at your?" at every subzone to facilitate in that. Yes, we do. We have a min-max for all the variables at each of the subzones. So, um, so this is substantially less data than, um, than the actual data is. But, uh, you know, yeah, that wasn't clear, but, uh, you know, we have, uh, it's, uh, there, there's only one subzone for every 256 cells. So, you know, it's, it's uh, one one hundredth roughly of the data. Uh, that you have for your cell data. So it is a little bit of an overhead, about a 1% overhead in, in storage. But we make up for that in some other compression approaches that we take. So uh, actually our files are smaller than they are with, uh, at least for finite elements. Yeah, and uh, a previous slide uh, mentioned interval arithmetic, uh, which we didn't uh, talk about yet. But for uh, calculated variables, that is uh, your Let's say you've got plot three, a plot3D uh, file or data that came from a plot3D file originally. So you'll have uh, density, momentum, and total energy in your uh, solution. But you want to plot pressure or temperature. So typically, you've, uh, you've calculated that as a new variable in your data set. You'll continue to do that, but you don't want to have to do the calculation over the entire uh, data set anymore. You'd like to be able to just calculate pressure and temperature where you're going to need it which is a little hard to predict a priori, which subzones, um, let's say, a, 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 an isosurface of pressure is going to pass through. But we take these subzone min-maxes of the input variables, the, the density, momentum, and energy, um, and do interval arithmetic to predict which subzones the, um, an isosurface is going to pass through, then lo load only those subzones, do the calculation, and then um, and then uh, calculate the isosurface. So even with uh, calculated variables, we can avoid loading most of the data. And the nice thing about interval arithmetic is it's a bound on the range of the real range. And so it, you, you never have a case where it, it's, uh, it predicts that a subzone doesn't need to be loaded when it, when it really should be loaded. It's always the other way. It's you know? So it's always conservative. Yeah. OK. So. Are there any other questions we need to address here before we move on? No, I think we can move on. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so here's another test case. Uh, 1.2 billion cells, uh, tetrahedrals in this case. Um, yeah, on the, on, on the standard tech plot, um, that uses... Um, uh, that uses 66.4 gigabytes, um, and we're going to show you. Um, are we going to load this now? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah so in, in in actually in the, this case, um, it uses. Um, um, looks like it's. Uh, yeah, we're missing a little bit of data here, but I believe it uses about two gigabytes of data with the subzone load on demand. I think we actually did a webinar on that, uh, Scott, you and I, about uh, mm -hmm. I don't know, late November, early December. Yeah, and we actually loaded it on the laptop we're working on today. So I mean, yeah. that, that was quite a miracle to be able to load. We, we, uh, we run this uh, test every night, um, and we load it on machines with uh, the, the worst machine we, we tested on is a, an 8 gigabyte. Uh, uh, it's a Windows machine with 8 gigabytes of memory. Yeah. And it loads uh, in a reasonable amount of time. So this is 2 billion cells, in, or 1.2 billion cells, and you can do it in a reasonable amount of time. So to summarize the advantages, um, if we have a faster time to our first plot. Um, if you have your, your favorite uh, isosurfaces um, or slices, you'll normally save those to a layout file, so all you have to do is open the layout file with uh, your newest data. Um, so you get to that plot much faster. Uh, the memory requirements, as just mentioned, are dramatically reduced. And for unstructured, or, or what in tech plot parlance, for historical reasons we call finite element data files, um, we get some compression on the connectivity, so they actually tend to be uh, smaller than um, uh, 
what I guess I'll call legacy TechLot data files. Um, it is worth uh, noting that we're not doing subzone load on demand for 1D or 2D data, but um, those uh, will still be in the file. And I'll, I'll mention why in, in the case of surfaces you'll want them there a little later. So to create subzone uh, loadable data files, we have two methods uh, available to you. Um, if you have existing data, your option is to use TechPlot 360EX itself as your converter, load it into 360, and then write, have 360 write out your subzone data file. Um, this requires, of course, a machine that uh, you can load the data on. Uh, but remember, uh, for most uh, data file formats, TechPlot these days is using uh, zone or zone variable load on demand, so you're not loading the entire data file all at once. But you are loading entire um, zones and variables at once. Your second option, and this, uh, of course, we hope to, is the future direction, is to use, is to create uh, subzone loadable data files directly from the, the simulation codes that produce the data. And the way to do that is with the TechIO library, which we've updated to output uh, the new file format. We'll talk a bit about more, a little more about each of these options. Uh, so converting files using TechPlot 360EX, you can convert any data file that uh, TechPlot can currently read. And although this, uh, this may take uh, longer. You can also set it up to, to do it in batch mode overnight or something like that in the case of really huge files. Uh, so at least hopefully you won't have to sit there watching it happen. Um, but uh, huge files do require huge machines. So you, you won't be able to do this conversion on your laptop. And it does take a bit longer to write these out than uh, writing a, a corresponding uh, legacy TechLot data file. Yeah, so Dave, I think uh, uh, one possible workflow you might see is somebody who has a, a, a script that they use to run their CFD code could actually, at the end of that script, run, uh, you know, run a batch, a tech plot in batch mode to generate the file. And so it could be done on a, you know, a bridge node out uh, near the, um, you know, near a fairly powerful computer out uh, available that's uh, for for post-processing, or even one of the nodes of the uh, supercomputer. Um, so that would be how I would envision this working. And another quick uh, question was brought in. Actually, we have uh, several papers on uh, this subject, uh, three of which I believe were published. Yes, we, we have. Uh, we've published uh, three papers on this um, at AIAA, and, uh, and uh, we also um, and the Oversight Conference, and, the Oversight Conference. and we also have uh, two white papers that are actually um, supersets of those papers that are available um, so for we'll, download we'll, from our website. Perhaps uh, we'll go ahead and send out a, at the end of the webinar to those people who attended. We can we'll send links to those. Mm -hmm. can, uh, Dave is pointing out that I want to make sure we have enough time to go through the examples. So we'll... yeah, no, I'm not worried. Okay, <laughs> I was just keeping track, making sure we're not going to run over. Um, so, but speaking of examples, let's do a small one. Of course, I had to, to pick one of reasonable size just so that um, you all don't have to, to sit there waiting while TechPlot churns for five minutes on a file. So I'm going to uh, convert a small case. This, uh, the source data here is um, a pair of Fluent solution files, one case and one data file. Um, about 50,000 uh, cells unstructured. Um, the total size of the Fluent case and data files is about 18 megabytes. Um, a classic PLT file, I'll write one of those out first, and then uh, the TechPlot SZPLT file. Um, and you'll see that um, we do get some size reduction. And Dave, I think in this case, the 20% we're referring to is from PLT to uh, That's right. SZ. Yeah. Whereas if you look at it from a case and data standpoint, it's uh, substantially less. Oops. All right, so let me bring up 360, and this is the, the beta of the new product now. And I'm going to load the case and data files. 
And so here we have the crutcher. Now, um, the way to interactively to write out your sizzle uh, PLT file now is to select write data file, which is what you've always done to write PLT files. Actually, let me um, let me write a PLT file first. Techplot binary data writer, and uh, I guess I'll just drop them on your desktop drill if that's no, all right. No. Okay. Um, so let's call this um, crutcher. The PLT, and we'll, we'll write everything. Okay, so we've got crutcher.plt on the desktop. Now let's write it as an SCPLT file. Notice, um, all, although, and this may not be obvious to, to all of you, maybe many of you haven't worked a lot with add-ons, um, but our uh, subzone loader and writer is all done uh, as a techplot add-on. So there's nothing you're seeing here um, that it, if you weren't uh, interested in writing add-ons yourself, you couldn't also do. So we've added um, the ability to register uh, data exporters from 360, um, and I'm taking advantage of that now with our uh, subzone loader. So I'm going to save this to the desktop also as an SCPLT file. And the... The write time was not dramatically different, but it did take a little bit longer. And uh, we, we don't know if we'll keep that information dialog in the release version or not. But um, something to notice is the, um, the PLT file, the first one we wrote, is about 12 megabytes. Um, it's a little bit harder because we have a, a bunch of auxiliary files, which in the final product we may all roll together. But these are, are a fairly trivial size. Here's the the main file, and that's about 10 megabytes. Um, the rest of these auxiliary files all put together, uh, this is 12K, you know, so that doesn't add significantly to the file size. But we now have an SCPLT file that, uh, if I go a new layout, uh, notice notice we've got uh, some some droppings here on on the uh, the screw in the middle of this. Um, you're going to see those disappear in the new file, and I'll talk about why in a second. So I'll um, not save my layout. I'll load the new SCPLT format. It's on the desktop. So there it is, crutcher.scplt. And you notice actually a couple of things different here. Um, we don't have any of the, any of the droppings on the, the, the screw uh, mixing blade here in the middle. <clears throat> uh, and also we've got this uh, orange box around the data. Well, what you're looking at here um, is, the, is only the surfaces. By default for, for SCPLT files, we turn off the plotting of surfaces. Um, in other words, uh, we do not by default have 360 uh, extract and display the surfaces or the, the uh, boundaries of your finite element or unstructured data as um, the existing uh, release of 360 does. The reason for that is that to calculate those boundaries we'd have to load all the data which would immediately defeat the purpose of having subzone loadable data. In this um, case Dave I think you're talking about uh, the volume, surfaces of the volume. Surfaces yeah, the surface volume, of, of uh, the volume. Volumes. The, the actual surfaces like in this case are clearly visible and the SCPLT file does include uh, surface, 3D surfaces. So, okay. Yeah, that's that's why we're seeing something. Uh, the first five zones here are, are the volume zones and we're not plotting the boundaries of those zones. What you're seeing are all the surface zones which uh, were also written to the SCPLT file. And I, I mentioned earlier you really want to do this if you possibly can. Um, mesh generators commonly will, will uh, output um, surfaces as well as the volume uh, mesh if you tell them to, and you want those uh, so that you can see them later without having TechPlot do that uh, boundary extraction which requires all your data to be loaded. Um, so that was the, the uh, example of using 360 as your uh, data conversion, and I'm looking for my PowerPoint now. Yes, yes, right. Okay. There you go. 
But the other option, and the option that I hope um, will be uh, adopted going forward, is using uh, the TechIO library to write uh, the new data file format directly. Before we go on, can uh, we have a question here that probably should be answered before we do any more. Uh, it says, if the Fluent file is transient, does an SE, uh, SEL file need to be written for each of the data files, or can it just be done once? Um, if you load all the transient data at once and then output the sizzled file, um, all of the time steps will be written to the one sizzled data file. Um, this does uh, bring up a, a question that I think I'll probably talk about more later um, in that um, the, the most natural uh, way to output that in TechPlot land would be to output um, one grid file and then multiple solution files, which really is quite analogous to the Fluent case and data files. Uh, we don't have that implemented with uh, sizzle data files yet, so you will uh, be creating one file that contains all the time steps today, um, but we'll, we'll work on that later. And it will take advantage of sharing, right, if it's a, if it's a common grid. So it, it won't necessarily be duplicating the grid, but it is required to be in one file. Okay, any other questions there before we move on? No, I think you, you got that one. Okay. Yeah, thanks. All right, so the, the advantages <clears throat> of uh, using the Tech I.O. library are that you don't have any intermediate file formats or conversions to perform. You get your uh, sizzle data directly. Um, the compression in the case of unstructured data will save you some disk space. Uh, Scott, what would you say is a, a typical compression for, I don't know, a, a brick data set with uh, eight or ten variables? We've gotten on, on our uh, various tests anywhere from 30% to 60% compression. Hmm. Yeah, so I'm it can be really substantial. Yeah. yeah, I'm averaging about 40%, Dave, most of the things I've looked at. Okay, yeah. thanks. Um, and to make uh, this step as easy as possible, we've designed uh, the new TechIO library to be a drop-in replacement for the old one. I'll demonstrate that in a moment. Uh, cons, of course, as we mentioned, it doesn't work for data files that you already have. Uh, this is just for creating new ones. And, as I, I just mentioned a moment ago, we don't have the separate grid and solution files available yet for, for the uh, sizzle data, but that hopefully is coming. So let's do a, a really small example. Uh, again, because I don't want you having to wait around too long to watch this, but I, I do want to uh, demonstrate how uh, the new data, the new TechIO file uh, library is a direct replacement for the old one. We're just going to do a 100 by 100 by 100 uh, brick uh, zone. So we've got uh, r roughly a million bricks, and uh, for PLT output, as you'll see, it takes about 11 seconds. Uh, for subzone PLT, about 14 seconds. So let me minimize this, and I'm going to have to navigate over to this folder. Okay. Um, so brick.exe uh, is the executable. It was built from brick.cpp. Let's have a quick look at that, that data file. I think I've got it open in an editor already. Yeah, here it is. So this is a, a C or C plus. I think it's a C file that was renamed to CPP. Um, we've got some. This is our main routine where we're setting the data up. But I wanted to show you the particular tech XXX functions or tech IO functions that were called uh, to give you an idea of uh, what it takes to create uh, a tech plot binary data file. First off, we call tech INI112 to basically to uh, pick a file name and uh, enter the variable names and uh, a few other things that are of less significance. Um, now that we're just setting up the data. Then for each zone, we call uh, tech ZNE 112 to pass it all the metadata about the zone, the zone size and the solution time, um, and whether it's uh, sharing variables or connectivity. Uh, then finally, we have to call tech DAT to output the variable data and tech node to output the connectivity. And then finally, tech end to tell uh, the tech IO library that we're done writing data. So you only have five function calls to... Yeah, five APIs will, will be called here. 
So, Dave, before we go on, mm -hmm. um, most CFD codes are still written in Fortran. How does this work in Fortran? Um, it, it works very much the same. The TechIO library has both uh, C, C++, and Fortran interfaces. So you would see exactly the same calls in a Fortran code. As a matter of fact, we'll be uh, delivering uh, 360EX with uh, uh, a couple of Fortran examples as, alongside the C or C++ examples. Um, so let me first off uh, run this with the, um, what I guess I could call the legacy TechIO library. Uh, I do that just by copying it into the same folder as my executable. So now uh, on Windows, uh, Windows will, will load any, will preferentially load any uh, local DLLs before it loads any others. So I'll just launch this by double clicking on it. It's a batch uh, code, so all we're going to see is a, a DOS window while it runs, and we get some diagnostic output, uh, which I haven't added to the new library yet. Um, but it's created uh, brick.plt, which, as you can see, is about a 40 megabyte file. Now to write the new file format, I just copy the new techio.dll, same name, uh, same APIs, and uh, overwrite the existing one. And now when I run brick.plt again, you'll see we're not getting the diagnostic output we were getting before. Um, might be nice if I added some of that. It's on my to-do list. Um, <laughs> You'll note if, if you started your stopwatch, which you probably didn't, it, it ran a few seconds longer. And it created uh, the main uh, SCPLT file plus um, these auxiliary files for the four variables. We, we're thinking of rolling all of these into a, a single file. We just haven't gotten to that yet. I think we have a question on that. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> it says, uh, asks about the number of, S, of SCPLT files. Um, is it dependent on the mesh size? And uh, can, it, can you get an excessive number of files? Well, as it stands today, um, you get one of these uh, SC tree files for every variable, uh, but you get only a single SCPLT file. Um, if I have my way, we'll roll all of these together, so you'll just get a single file. But if you have 100 zones in your file, or 100 time steps, it doesn't create additional uh, That's That's files. right. You get yeah. just a, a single... SCPLT file and one SC tree per variable okay. today. And, and that's probably the direction we are going to go, Dave. So okay, um, I don't so get my whenever wish. you want to roll that sucker <laughs> in, go right ahead. Oh, okay, I, I might get my wish. Good, <laughs> your wish is granted. All right, make it so. <laughs> and then uh, lo looking again at the the file sizes, uh, the original uh, brick.plt, the older format, is almost forty six megabytes. And if we add up the SCPLT plus the fairly trivial amount for the tree files, uh, we're still well under 30 megabytes uh, combined. So we're getting some fairly good compression there. Um, there's a question. Any issues with big data and 32-bit indexing? Uh, yes. Um, it's the same issue that uh, we've had for a very long time with 360. We're limited to about 2 billion cells. Uh, right now. Per zone. Per zone, yeah. yeah. So if, um, let's see, do we have a slide on parallel issues later? I don't think I so. I think we, we do. Yeah. We do. Oh, do we? Okay. Yeah, yeah so it, uh, we have done up to uh, 30 billion cells, but it does require breaking your data down into multiple levels. So you have, that might have, um, you know, 15 zones and and then each zone is broken into sub zones in order to do that. So it, it's uh, eventually that will be taken care of. Yeah. So uh, we demonstrated the the current state of uh, outputting our sub zone loadable uh, PLT files. Um, I'd like to talk briefly about future directions. Um, you just heard Darrell give me permission to roll all the SC tree files <laughs> <laughs> into, into the SC. Yeah, I've got it on, on tape now. You yes, can't take it all back. witnesses. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, hopefully those uh, auxiliary files will go away soon. But the other future directions um, is outputting uh, separate grid and solution files, as you can do today for uh, PLT files. 
um, which will uh, be advantageous for transient flows where you have non-moving grid. Um, uh, that'll be that'll be a, a, a nice option. You'll be able to uh, drop um, a solution. You'll be able to have your solver drop a, another solution file for every time step, um, rather than having to output all of it and then um, and then translate it later. Um, for uh, domain decomposed, as we were talking about a moment ago, uh, this is common uh, with uh, massively parallel uh, simulations. You have an enormous zone, but you break it up into, um, I, I think, typically uh, 50 to 200 um, million uh, cells per calculation node. And we'd like to uh, have better support for that so that you can have multiple nodes uh, writing different pieces of a single zone and yet have all those come together, have those uh, be separate files, but still all come together as a single zone in, in 360. To do that, of course, we'll we'll have to address the, the 2 billion cell per zone limitation within 360 and also um, implement uh, the multiple files per zone format uh, as an extension of the current SCPLT format. Um, we also want to uh, make these files more accessible uh, to your processes which um, in which you, uh, you know, 360 is probably not the only uh, executable you have that needs to be able to access your simulation data. So we'd like to uh, produce some reading APIs to allow your internal codes uh, to to uh, query uh, Sizzle data files. And uh, so you can you can use Sizzle as your one data file rather than uh, having to you know hang, keep your plot 3D data files or whatever around just because you know how to read those. Um, and then of course uh, once we're writing uh, files that are that overflow the 32-bit signed integers, uh, which is, as I said, about 2 billion cells, um, we'll need to add new APIs um, to allow you to enter those larger, for example, the zone sizes in your call to tech CNE, because currently all the tech IO APIs take 32-bit um, uh, integers. Um, so we'll have to expand that to 64-bit integer APIs. It looks like we're getting more questions we over here. We have a couple more questions, and then Darrell wants to show something. But um, one of them is, will, will the SCPLT files help with redraw time? And I'll take that one. Uh, at this point, no, they don't exactly, they don't help with redraw time after you rotate, for instance. So if you're rotating and it, and it redraws slowly, um, it won't help with that. But there is, uh, um, for, during the rotation, there are uh, techniques available in the in TechPlot to speed things up, and that is you go into the options dialog and select um, and and select uh, what is it uh, approximate grids. Yeah, we can actually walk through that. Yeah, and that that'll uh, that'll speed it up pretty dramatically for you. It'll take a, a couple seconds to generate the approximate grids, but that's much faster. And then finally, uh, with the new TechIO library, can I choose? To write the old style PLT file. Uh, no, we don't have uh, writing both formats in a, a single library. Um, that's a possibility. I, I guess um, I'm I'm struggling to understand what the what the utility of that would be. I guess if if you have workmates who um, who are using older versions of 360 uh, that therefore can't read the Sizzle files, you you do always have the option of writing older formats from TechPlot itself, though. Right. Okay, I think Darrell had a, another... Uh, well, I was going to just uh, oh, okay. show some of the results, so I'm going to swing in here. Okay. My musical chairs for a second. I'm just going to maybe walk through a couple examples of the speed-ups. Uh, truly uncached, which is always nice, because uh, I just, <laughs> uh, just actually did this in That's when it doesn't work. All right. Um, so you, we've kind of shown you how to load the data. I wanted to show a couple of larger files. We've done this a couple of times in the past, but I think it's worth uh, showing here today. So I'm going to uh, load in a file. In this case, it's about 190 million cells uh, in the SCPLT format, just to give you an idea of what the performance improvements are. Um, and you can actually uh, 
currently, we have a profiling mechanism. It will likely not be released with the, the version that goes out commercially. Uh, but we use this internally to help us understand effectively uh, how fast or what kind of performance improvements we're seeing. So I'm going to profile the opening of a layout. And uh, yesterday, I was fortunate enough to, to get another disk drive in my little laptop by replacing the optical drive, which I think is becoming very common, because I don't remember the last time I put an optical disk in there. <laughs> Actually, I don't even know if I could find Steve an optical disk. Steve Jobs was right. <laughs> <laughs> That's Steve character. <laughs> so there, there's a couple of examples we could look at, but uh, we're going to go ahead and start by just looking at uh, that transport airplane example. And uh, we're looking at a slice using the new uh, SCL PLT or the SCPLT format. And basically what we're doing now is we're going to be loading it off the disk. This is a slightly slower disk. That's the disadvantage of, uh, of a laptop. So this is not off my solid state disk. This is actually just off my uh, good old fashioned, uh, I think it's 5,000 5, RPM, something like that. It's pretty yeah, slow. Yeah. So whereas on my, uh, my solid state disk, I can usually get this done in three to five seconds. On, uh, on this disk, it looks like it's about 13.7 seconds. So... And to be clear, though, this is actually loading the data and creating the slice, all of that in 13 seconds, so which is, yeah. you know, it's probably two orders of magnitude faster oh, it, than it, if you, at least. Yeah. you had to load the full how big is How big is this um, data set? This data set, as I recall, is about 185 million cells. Mm, okay. So it's pretty substantial. Uh, the other thing that, yeah, we realize is that as you go through and you create an, an additional slice, it has to query the subzones, and so in that context, it is slightly slower. I've noticed about it's about 20% slower than if you had had all the data loaded initially. With However, a legacy. with a legacy format. Um, so the to give you an idea, and you know, it takes a little longer. So I'm going to fire up a second session, so we don't have to waste uh, time watching it spool. Uh, but we'll profile the opening of uh, a data file. In this case, uh, we're going to be looking at the PLT format. Um, and it's important to point out that you could load that data, and that's, uh, I know that some people have said, oh gosh, you know, I have a 200 million cell model, I'm not even sure if I should open it to begin with, uh, but as I'll show you, it's, it's quite, you know, possible to both open and work with data files of this size on a, on a typical engineering workstation. And, um, and to be clear, you know, we've actually been working on improving this as well, um, sure. you know, with the standard PLT files, we have up to a factor of two improvement. Um, depending on what you're doing. Yeah. And we've done comparisons against other visualization packages and mm -hmm. you know we, we compare very well with them. You know in, in most cases we're faster, some cases maybe a little bit slower but um, comparable and uh, not, not this is with PLT we're comparable. Absolutely. With SEPLT we're much faster. Yeah it's, it's pretty significant and um, you know I think uh, someone had brought up, and I guess it was David who brought up, okay, or was it David or Kyle, had asked uh, the question about performance. Under options, there's performance, and if you use approximate plots, basically what it does is grid decimation, uh, which, as uh, Scott pointed out, initially it has to go through and do that decimation, but once you actually have it, when you rotate, you could see that you're actually rotating less data, but as a result, it's extraordinarily snappy. And then just does the full redraw when you let go of the mouse. Yeah, when you let go of the mouse, it pulls the data in. Now, you can, in fact, for very uh, fine mesh, sometimes there's an advantage uh, to leaving it on permanently, which basically is an option. Mm -hmm. So if you choose, you could actually go into performance, and uh, you can have this approximate all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that just basically makes it so that it doesn't refresh all the data. So. And actually, when you do that, a redraw, if you push the redraw button on the side, I believe it still does. It should, uh, yeah. Why don't you hit redraw once through? Let's give it a go and see if it works. Yeah. This yeah, is so there you get the full plot. But you have to hit redraw, or otherwise um, you will see. Hmm, what file can I read? <laughs> okay. Well, that's just... Uh, so it just, fin the, it just the finished. The other tech plot just finished loading the, the initial layout. So at about 113 seconds. We have another question, and it... Uh, Perhaps Dave can take this. Does the Tech I.O. library support parallel I.O.? Um, I'm going to say no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can have uh, you can have um, 
different nodes writing to different files, but um, let me think. Let me let me make sure I, I'm accurate here. Um, if because uh, the the uh, our sizzle or SCPLT files, um, your your solution to today needs to be in a single file. We haven't implemented um, multiple um, files per uh, zone. Um, you'll you'll typically do what you do already probably if you're writing out PLT files, um, which is to have a single I/O node and uh, have your different compute nodes passing data to the I/O node uh, to write out to the, the single file. Um, did I miss anything there, Scott? Yeah, there are there are people who currently with our tech, current tech I/O will will write to separate files. Um, but that so, means they're creating separate. So zones. they're creating separate. Yeah. So they're bra they're, they have a domain decomposition, and they they write those domains into into separate files, and then you when you load it into TechLot, you have to load those separate files simultaneously, and, which you can do with Sizzle, um, and then you. But you end up with separate. Zones. But you end, end up with extra extra zones. But um, it's an option, and that is something that we want to to work with people on in the future and this is yeah as a matter of goals. fact if, if any of you are in this uh, situation and, and you're interested in in uh, helping uh, guide our future direction here with with regard to a massively parallel computation data output uh, we'd love to talk more to you about that and similarly uh, if you're interested in our beta program uh, you can pop over to uh, TechBlock Well, that's interesting. Look at that. It's got music. <laughs> that's, that's just awesome. I'm sure someone thought that would be great to put their CFD <laughs> results to music, but anyway. Um, so if you go to the main page and click on the TechBot 360EX, it'll bring you to uh, this page, which uh, you'll see there's Join the Beta Program. And uh, we're pretty liberal. I mean, uh, all we ask is that you give us uh, information about who you are, and you, you can have access. Um, we also have a, it puts you into something called Basecamp. Uh, there you go, Actually, it's right there. And uh, in Basecamp, there is a project that basically we uh, use for the beta program and basically allows you to ask questions or, uh, you know, post uh, suggestions. And we try to be very uh, responsive in terms of if you have a good suggestion, if we can try to put it into what we're doing, we try to do that as, as quickly as possible. So. I'd encourage you to uh, go ahead and sign up for the beta program. We'd certainly like to have you there. Um, I did want to quickly talk about some of the other improvements just so that uh, for those people who uh, maybe have asked for these things in the past, um, and actually probably the easiest thing to do would be to quickly show you uh, this. And, and again, if you have questions, we have a, a few minutes for questions. We'll open up to uh, general questions in about uh, three minutes here. So uh, quickly, you can see that there are several types of slices one can create. Uh, we're actually going to look at a slice through the volume zones for a moment, and uh, we're only going to show a slice for simplicity. Okay, so we have a slice, and uh, actually I don't see need to mesh at this point. Okay, so we have a slice on the wing. This is a simple UAV case. Uh, this is an open source geometry. One of the challenges we have is we have lots of really cool data that we can't show you because <laughs> uh, many of the people we work with the data that they, they create or generate is ITAR or, or otherwise uh, uh, under right, NDA proprietary. proprietary. Um, so one of the things that we implemented recently, and let's see if I can put this in the X axis. So if, you, uh, if you're unfamiliar with this, you can actually change the axis of a slice, uh, usually by typing the, the letter of the axis you're interested in. In this case, I put it in the X axis. Okay, um, we implemented arbitrary slicing. So in this case, uh, we are, oh, and then, by the way, this is a beta. This is, beta. It's, well, <laughs> it is a beta, and so there's uh, always the, the possibility uh, that it, we could find a, a dark corner, but so I wouldn't worry too much about it. The, the final release uh, will make sure that it, it doesn't have any uh, drama in that case. But Okay, so we have now, or should have, the arbitrary slice available. Um, and basically, this is a, a pretty big data set. It's probably not the most optimal one to show, but... Um, we're going to, if you go into the details here on arbitrary, you can actually play with the origin. Maybe I'll bring this up 
uh, say to 30, just to see if I can get that to a different state. And uh, one of the things that we're looking at is mechanisms to uh, do extractions in, in a more convenient way. I'm still not seeing the interactor. Maybe the interactor's off scale here. There it is. Okay. Uh, so here's the interactor. I'll just move it down closer to the plane itself. And uh, you can actually then rotate that slice. Uh, move this around. So I can grab the, the point here and actually orient the slice uh, in any axis I want. Of course, I can do that via the, the dialog as well. So these are some of the, the capabilities we've been working on. Uh, additionally, we've added capabilities around the uh, right-click context menu. So if I click on an object, for example, if I clicked on the fuselage, I can you know, put velocity magnitude as the contour variable very quickly. So, um, so those are just a couple of things. We'll actually have a couple of webinars where we'll go through in great detail uh, on how you use some of the new capabilities. They'll be more tutorial based and that'll be closer to the release which is coming up pretty soon here. And with that I'd like to open it up to questions uh, for those people who may have questions that weren't answered. We'll go ahead and open it up at this time. So again to ask a question one needs to go to the questions sidebar as part of GoToWebinar and you can just type a question in there directly. I think we've kind of hit on a lot of the, the questions already. Um, let's see, there was a question here about reversibility, um, which basically people are asking the question if you can, I have data in Plot 3D, for example, Scott, and if I, if I convert it into SCPLT, can I go back to a Plot 3D file? Yeah, and the answer is, at this point, no. You can go back to a PLT file use, using TechBot, but that is our intent in the future make that possible to the extent it is even you know feasible right there are some file formats where um, you will you know we don't have the capability of knowing everything that was in the file mm -hmm. but for those formats where we do know what's in the file that that's something we will we will uh, be looking at doing in a, in a future release we'd also like to make it unnecessary uh, <laughs> by, uh, <laughs> by allowing you know by allowing your code to read SCPLT files. I, I think the, the reasons I'm aware of that, that someone might be interested in going back to a Plot 3D file would be um, if they need to, to share it with somebody who doesn't have an SCPLT reader um, mm -hmm. or if they have in-house codes that can read Plot 3D data. And in, the, in the latter case, we'd, we'd like to enable your codes to read SCPLT files. Yeah. Um, there was a question about the anticipated release date. I think it's important to point out that uh, it's still in heavy beta testing and because we've uh, ripped the uh, code apart and tried to put it all back together, we're still finding er errors like the one I, that we saw here this morning. So um, I'm hoping for March, or I'm sorry, April, early April, but it depends on a lot of things. We've got to make sure that it's, it's quite stable before we get it out there. That being said, we have a very open beta program and, and therefore if... Uh, if you are interested in getting your hands on it in advance of the official release, you're, you're certainly welcome to do so. Yeah. Uh, and as long as you do it with a grain of salt, meaning that uh, if it misbehaves, as it did a moment ago, you just have to understand that that's uh, <laughs> yeah. being worked on as we speak. Uh, we have a question about macros. Um, can you use your old macros to go through transient solution files with the SCPLT files? Yes, with caveats. Uh -huh. First of all, you'll have to change change it so it reads an SCPLT instead of PLT. So that'll be a modify to your, your load data macro, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the second is you might want to turn off anything that, gen, that would extract an outer boundary if that's in your macro, just uh, unless you truly need it because that'll slow it down. So those would be the two uh, caveats, but definitely uh, the vast majority of the macro scripts um, will work just fine with minor modifications. Now, and, uh, another very common question around data formats, uh, at least that we've been running into, is, um, well, I don't want to move my data from CGNS, I just want to leave it there. Will this technology improve uh, performance with just CGNS files, for example? Um, and I think that the short answer to that is, uh, at, at this point, you do need to convert it. Uh, again, going back to the indexing and uh, domain decomposition using orthogonal bisection. Um, but 
And that being said, we are looking at some strategies to perhaps extend some of this indexing to CTNS files. I don't know if you want to comment on that, Scott. Um, well, that's, it's vaporware right now. It's vaporware, <laughs> yeah. We don't, we don't really have anything for that at this point. But um, it is possible we might be able to at least reduce the amount of memory you use. Um, I, I do think, though, that in order to get the performance gains we're looking at, um, you know, you, you're going to need to go to the new format. You may get some performance gains, but it won't be the same level of performance gain. I suppose further out, you know, CGNS itself might uh, incorporate a subzone, uh, uh, subzone loadable data into its format, um, but you know, that that would be several years out, I expect. Yeah. yeah. And uh, we're quite active with the uh, CGNS uh, committee. And yeah, we're on, on the I'm on the steering committee, so it's, you know, we would have some, at least a, a say in such a thing. And we have time for maybe one more, one or two more questions. So if you have anything uh, that you want to add to the conversation, feel free to do so at this point. Otherwise, uh, we're going to be finishing up in maybe the next minute or so. So. Um, it doesn't look like we have any outstanding questions. Uh, first, I just want to thank uh, Dave and Scott. Thank you for coming in and oh, uh, talking yeah. about this this morning. My uh, pleasure. Thank uh, you. It was a little earlier than we usually do these. <laughs> <laughs> it's 8 o'clock on the West Coast. so uh, For a you. software developer, that's just obscenely early. <laughs> <laughs> we were talking 8 at night. Now we're talking. <laughs> um, so I'd like to thank all of you who participated. Uh, the recording will be available online likely by this afternoon. Uh, there were a couple of requests for both the presentation and for the papers. And uh, I will coordinate with uh, our internal resources to see if we can't get those out to you, or at least links to those out to you so that you can uh, take a look at this technology. Again, thank you for your time this morning. And uh, we look forward to our next webinar, which will likely be in early April. And uh, there are two things that we're looking at. We, we haven't kind of solidified. One's going to be uh, working with a partner who does immersive boundary, immersed boundary data. This is Carolit Technologies, so we're doing a, a joint webinar with them. And we will have another more tutorial-based TechPlot 360 webinar in the early April timeframe. So thank you again for joining us, and we'll see you at the next webinar.